I'm David Peterson, the creator of Mouse Guard, and welcome to Creator Commentary for the second series of Mouse Guard, Winter 1152. This episode will cover issue 4, or chapter 4, when it was collected into a hardcover edition. For this issue, I'll be doing the commentary as audio only, but please feel free to follow along in your copy of the story, either in issue form or from the hardcover, as I talk about the behind-the-scenes details, art notes, and my headspace as I go page by page and panel by panel. Also, a fair warning, there will be spoilers if you have not yet read this or the rest of the Mouse Guard series. Cover. Like I mentioned in the last commentary, my plan was to have this cover feature Saxon alone. Knowing where the story was going in terms of darkness, I wanted to prepare the readers for where we were going right on the cover. The last we saw of Saxon in issue 3, he was flying off into the darkness on the back of a bat. So this cover could have even implied that Saxon was dead. For years, this was my favorite Mouse Guard cover, as well as my favorite issue. Drawing all those bones is something that seems like a complicated mess, but it's where I tend to just get lost, enjoying the detail of the overlapping shapes. On the back side of the cover art, hidden in the bones, is the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. I get asked about it a lot. I thought it would actually be hidden and covered up by the Archaea website that was usually printed on the back of the issue about there. But production happened to reposition the text, so Han's ship was visible from day one. This image of Saxon on the bones is also one of the largest tattoos a fan has ever shown me. He has most of the front cover all up his side, and it was amazingly flattering to see in person. Inside front cover. Recounting the last issue here is text explaining the bat scenario and Liam and Kalanaw with the owl. It's pretty sparse text and pretty straightforward. The spot illustration of the fruit-bearing bush or tree covered in snow isn't anything directly symbolic. It's just a winter scene. I found some photo reference for this, or I may have even taken the photo. I'm unsure. The poem, uh, like the remaining ones in this arc, is about death. Death for Kalanaw coming, and dead bones of Lucas, and the importance of lives well-lived with nothing being taken for granted. In the fifth line, the next rhyme only works if you pronounce rout as root. This poem is again attributed to Roybin the Scribe, a character introduced through a fan contest that was won by Lori Johnson. Page one. I've got an odd panel arrangement going on here compared to my usual, but I needed five beats, with the last being the owl foot, which is pretty much the only thing mentioned in my working outline for this page. Quote, owl foot crashes through snow cave roof. Panel one. With the candle being a topic of conversation between Liam and Kellanaw last issue, I started this issue off with a small panel of the candle nearly burned down. It shows how close they are to being out of time, but also implies that perhaps time has gone by a bit since the last issue, that they've been trapped in their shelter for an hour or more as the sounds above continue. Panel 2. A wider shot to reestablish where we are, who is in the scene, and the f sound effect scritch scritches to show what they are dealing with. The up angle of the camera also helps direct the viewer to where the noise is coming from. Panels 3 and 4. I wanted Kellanaw and Liam to each have their own reaction shot panels to slow down the pacing and amp up the tension. Add in that owl foot afterwards and an establishing shot and the page is already up to four panels. And I liked using that candle as a better intro to the issue than just starting with the up angle panel. Kellanaw is miming shh, don't make a sound kind of gesture, while Liam is angrily pointing up to the ceiling like he's right there. Panel five, boom, in comes that owl foot. I looked at a reference photo for an owl swooping in to land on a perch for how to draw the bottom of an owl foot. As an artist, it's okay to reference and research these things. I think a lot of young artists feel like everything has to be pulled fresh out of their imaginations, and that's just not the case. Page 2. The outline for this page simply says, Kelena is pulled to the surface. Panel 1. A moment after panel, showing a split second after the last panel on the previous page. But I've pulled back a bit so that we can see Liam for a sense of space and grounding, that Kalanaw is being pulled up off the shelter's floor and th out through the ceiling. Panel 2. 
Because I knew I was going to drag this fight out for a bit, I was careful to have the owl biting down on Kalinos' pauldron, his shoulder armor, and not his flesh. He'd be too badly injured to be believably alive to continue on if I let the owl get at him right away. Panel 3. The next bit in the outline for pages 3 through 5 say, Kalinos and Liam square off against the owl. And while we are still on page 2, I started choreographing some of the battle here. As the owl is crushing Kelenos' metal armor, the old mouse is readying his grip on the axe for the next page. It also worked well visually that Kelenos' armor and the owl's red eye are each on the same side. Page 3, panels 1 through 3. Liam exiting from the collapsed ice shelter with a classic mouse guard punctuation mark word balloon. Then onto the owl crushing the pauldron more, and back to a Liam point of view with another punctuation mark word balloon. Switching the size of the owl in these panels and going back and forth from Liam to the owl and back to Liam helped the reading rhythm and storytelling. Also in these pages, I tried to at least once per page show the owl at full scale with the mice or in a reference point of the landscape. It helps remind the reader of how small the mice are, not only to the owl, but to the bleakness of this winter. Panel four. This reaction panel is almost like the payoff for the facing panel from page two. While I didn't mirror the page layouts like I've done on lots of pages in the past, I did mirror the last panels of this spread on purpose. Page four, panel one. I used a lot of photo reference for the owl in this series, looking through books and online image resources, but some angles I had to just make up. While panels two and three here were drawn with the aid of reference, this panel, panel one, was something I drew from scratch. And it shows a bit. The falling snow certainly helped hide a lot of sins in the wing anatomy. Panel two. Here's another one of those panels with the character and owl in scale with one another. Kalanaw is coming up from the snowy indent he formed from plummeting from the owl's beak. And then he speaks in hoots. The ability to speak to other beasts was always meant to be a rare gift in Mouse Guard. Not like parcel tongue in Harry Potter, where it's an actual gift you were born with, but that here the study or learning and understanding an animal's speech different from your own is so difficult that few would even take the time to bother to know what a predator is saying. I'd already found the owl's font for the next panel, which had dots in and around some of the letters, so I added some dots to the normal mouse speech font to imply an accent when Kelenaw hoots. Panel 3. The owl's reply tells the reader this is a conversation now. With the last panel, all we really know is that Kelenaw is saying hoot to an owl, which could be like taunting or imitation. But the owl hooting back confirms that this is a two-way street. I chose to make the type and balloon white with the balloon black to make the language seem very foreign to our mouse-centric point of view. Page 5. Panel 1. Liam is now catching up to the action, sword bared and asking the question for the audience, what did it say? In Mouse Guard, I treat the animal languages where you can always understand your own species, and the further you get away from your own species, the more it becomes foreign. So a mouse may hear other small rodents or prey animals as speaking their language, but with an accent. Larger beasts may be speaking a discernible language, but of a foreign tongue. And when you get to feather and scale, a mouse just hears noises, like hoots and hisses. Panel 2. I like that I chose a small panel here to deliver a big impact, almost like the weight of the line is too big for that panel. Eyes unmoved from the owl, Kalanaw answers Liam. This ends in death. A big concept for just three hoots, but perhaps it was all in the owl's inflection that got the point across. Note that while the owl was biting on Kalanaw's armor, he is still bleeding from underneath it, a visual I hoped got the reader worried about Kalanaw's fate after a line like this. Panel 3. It was nice to have the room to make this moment a big panel. I remember looking back to the moment in fall when Kalanaw and Midnight are running, swinging sword and axe towards each other, a duel of the fates confrontation. And I echoed it here, just on a different scale for the owl and Kalanaw to battle. And because in winter I was dealing with scene transitions and how to go from one place to another, I decided purposely after setting up this fight to not return to it until the next issue to make this a real cliffhanger. Page 6. 
The outline calls for three pages of, quote, Saxon, a bat, and a pile of bones. Panel one. So we start off the scene transition from the white of the snow to the dark, dark of dark heather. The dialogue here from Saxon not only tells the reader that Saxon had been in dark heather once before, something I thought I'd implied, but that I don't come out right out and say until this panel, and something I don't put more explanation on until the next issue. But Saxon is also implying that the tale of woe that the bats echoed in the last issue may not be entirely true. That Saxon saw the bats in Dark Heather with the weasels. Panel 2. The different escape is referencing that Saxon got away from Dark Heather the last time. Drawing Saxon brandishing a sword fragment as he dangles from a bat's ear in a mouse hell is kind of the perfect imagery for how Saxon gets himself in over his head and is still bold as brass in the thick of it. Panel 3. This panel and panel 2 were originally smaller in my first layout for the page. I left a little bit more room for the first establishing shot to have a bit more space to breathe. It made panel 1 very nice, but the other two suffered, especially this panel of the upshot of the ceiling and the hole letting in a shaft of light and snow, something I tried to imply with color on the previous panels. For reference, I photographed my archway model of Dark Heather upside down, and then I assembled the photos in Photoshop, and then drew the design for the ceiling details and tile work in Photoshop to get the perspective and geometry right before going to ink it. The bat is taunting Saxon that if he had wings, he could fly out of Dark Heather right then. Page 7, panel 1. And continuing here, the bat threatens letting Saxon fall not just to the floor below, but through a hole in the floor, lined up with the hole in the ceiling. Panel 2. Here's a better view of that ring around the hole. It's a combination of bones and stone, and I made it too hard to read, but in the stones are the letters reading, Rise to thy stars above. As we will see in later pages, beneath that hole is a massive pile of mouse bones, a mountain of graves of the mice imprisoned to breed, be tortured, and to serve as bait for more mice to rescue them when the weasels ruled this place. I wanted the weasels to be superstitious about trapping the souls of their victims down there, though. So this alignment of vents and the ceremonial ring are meant to reflect that belief. Panel 3. An oddly shaped and placed panel of Saxon's bold statement. But I knew I needed to end the page on them falling, and I didn't have enough space to show everything else without one panel being small. And this felt the best panel to shrink and still be readable. Panel 4. This panel is also a little shorter because of panel 3, but it gets the job done wordlessly. I did a color hold on the black of the bat's eye to show that some of the life has already literally left its body. Blood-wise, this was one of the panels I wondered if I was on the edge of being too dark with, especially with the little thin drip connecting the wound to the blade. And there's a right-hand-left-hand continuity issue between this and other panels of Saxon holding the bat's ear and his sword in different paws. Oops. Panel 5. And they silently tumble into the blackness of that hole, meant for souls to depart by. Because Saxon doesn't always think, he just reacts. I think that Saxon wasn't ready to die here. He was just so angry that he planned to deal with whatever the consequences were of this as he fell. Page 8, panel 1. This cutaway showing the room we were just in, and the double domed room connected by a shaft of light, was meant to be evocative of the scene in the Two Towers film when Gandalf and the Balrog fall for ages. I made a model of the domed room, but it was mostly just printouts of arches glued to Bristol board with no real dimension other than the overall curve of the dome. The second dome, the little one at the top of the room, was harder to make and involved me finding a sphere paper craft model that already existed and then gluing in a pattern I had drawn for the Mouse Guard RPG. To add some visual clarity, I tinted the ink work of the falling forms to red and purple so you understood that they were Saxon and the Bat. Panel 2. It was fun drawing the scattered trail of bones caused by the two hitting the pile and tumbling down it. I didn't want to show either character's face here. Uh, that way I could limit the amount of expression the reader might see or be able to perceive. 
I wanted the fates of these two characters to be ambiguous, at least for a panel. Panel 3. With Saxon's eyes closed, I did my best to keep that tension going. Is he alive or dead? And with the bat out of sight, is the bat alive or dead? And what could that mean for Saxon if the bat is still alive? This panel is essentially the cover of the issue, and I try to make sure when showing a cover moment of an issue to make it a smaller panel in the layout so as to not repeat myself. That way, I'm also sure to give space and weight in the book to the other moments around it that tell the story. Page 9. The three panels on this page are an upshot, a downshot, and a long shot. I made sure I came up with a different viewpoint for each beat of this talking bat page. The bats understand that death is deeply connected with that ring, though it seems like they don't understand it really, like they've given it some magical property of it causing death. This helped build a superstitious worldview that the bats have, as well to explain why they don't fly down and check on their fallen brother. I ended panel two with the echo of the word death around the hole, and then used panel three to have the bats invested in the rise to thy stars above saying that's around the hole's tile work. Page 10. The outline calls for this scene to be four pages as, quote, Kenzie and Sadie search for Saxon, talk, and sing. Panel 1. I had to walk a balance in these pages of showing Dark Heather even darker than the last issue when the party had a lantern, but not have every panel be solid black, which also made the coloring harder so that the characters were believably in that space, but still visible too. For this panel and a lot of this scene, Kenzie has balloons of just calling for Saxon. He is meant to be feeling like he's missing a limb, not having his red-cloaked companion around. And while Saxon and Kenzie's love is a brotherly love, Saxon not being present makes room for other love to blossom. Panel 2. The darkness of these scenes meant I didn't have to go so heavy on photo reference or model building. Sadie's original line in this panel was that the darkness of this place was favorable to the isolation of Frostic, and that it was hard to imagine she'd rather be in Dark Heather than some other place. But the rewording in the published issue, I think, is cleaner and also more believable. Panels 3 and 4. After a medium and wide panel, it felt like it was time for two close-ups, especially with this dialogue. Dialogue I don't see in my script notes for this scene, which was written in ballpoint pen on two hotel room notepad sheets. I suspect that as I was drawing this, I knew I needed to be asking the question on the page that the reader was wondering, is Saxon alive? and then Kenzie answering in a way that he emotionally needs. Page 11. This page is almost a 180-degree rotation of the same panel layout as the previous page. Panel 1. Except that this is one panel instead of the two occupied in the same relative location on page 10. The dialogue of Sadie's was here for two reasons. One, she is testing the waters of complimenting Kenzie, but through a pointed statement of Saxon's, and two, I wrote this so that Kenzie is referred to as a he, something I'd never specifically done in the book, which caused some confusion from fans. It always seemed obvious to me that Kenzie was male. He was based on a friend of mine. But I found after Fall came out, it wasn't so clear to the audience. One little girl at a convention even cried when she found out at my table that Kenzie was a boy mouse. So I carefully crafted this dialogue to help make it clearer. Panel 2. I did do a photo collage of some Moorish towers pasted together to create this architecture, but because it was going to be mostly in shadow and inked, I didn't have to do too good of a job of making it, and believable or accurate in any other way. Sadie appears to be defending Saxon's actions a bit here in this panel. Panel 3. And again in panel 3, though here she tosses in a compliment about the tactic she'd hoped would win the day, which is the very one Kenzie is associated with. The chair next to Sadie is a reminder to the audience that the mice are in weasel territory, and that's not just a predator-prey issue, but also a scale issue. Page 12, panel 1. This dining hall with the chairs overturned was to help show Dark Heather as abandoned and not just vacant. With Kenzie critical of Saxon on the last page, it's got Sadie changing her tune a bit, now calling out Saxon. 
Her dialogue here is a bit heavy handed, though. I don't think Sadie really would think or even just say for the sake of a talking point that Saxon is sexist in this way. But it was what I came up with as a writer to lead into Kenzie's lines about Saxon loving a mouse from afar. In the original script notes, again from the hotel pad, Sadie then starts to suggest female guard mice who it could be, and Kenzie replies, I will keep his confidence. Of course, the mouse he has loved from afar is Gwendolyn. And I do have the scene moment in my head that Kenzie is talking about here, of the day that they met, and how Kenzie knows about Saxon's love for Gwendolyn. Panel 2. Instead of the dialogue I mentioned that Kenzie would say about keeping his confidence, I put in this throwback to a line from Fall about Saxon that Liam says, Saxon knows not from subtle. Why are they climbing over stools and overturned chairs instead of walking around them? Well, it's because as a choreographer, I wanted some visual interest and body acting for the next several panels. Panel 3. Like here, for instance where I let that last question hang in the air as the two lock eyes and hold pause. Looks like I know not from subtle either. Panel 4. Kenzie's reply is almost verbatim from my hotel pad script notes. The reader is meant to think here that he's cooling off and logicking his way out of any feelings. Page 13, panel 1. But as he grabs pause again with Sadie to help her down from the chair in this panel, His dialogue implies that he very much has her in mind when he's listing the traits of who he'd want to be with. At the time, I thought I was writing this in a very subtle way, and that it wasn't obvious or heavy-handed. That's not to say I regret how this scene plays out, but it's not cleverly vague, either. Panel 2. The moment got too real. I didn't want to have guard mice have a Jedi code that prohibits love, but as the previous dialogue suggests, that relationships makes the job more difficult, and that it's hard to find a partner who can handle being invested in a guard mouse. But is this moment about that weight, or the weight of any new love in every relationship where you are nervous about entering into it at first because of how powerful it feels? Panel 3. Let's get to the singing. I wanted to add in this singing bit for three reasons. One, The real-life inspiration for Kenzie, Jesse Glenn, was doing a lot of musical theater at the time, and I thought having Kenzie sing a ballad would be a great way to infuse some character building into the mouse. Two, I'd read a trivia fact that some mice, quote, sing when mating, that their squeaks are more like song and not just language or a mating cry, and as I'm pairing up Kenzie and Sadie, it felt like the right time for a song. Panel four. And number three... I needed some kind of narrative to overlay the silent actions of the next scene. This made writing the Ballad of the Ivory Lass a bit tricky, as I needed to have a romantic thread to make sense as to why Kenzie is singing to Sadie, but also have enough horror and daring do to be congruent with the Saxon scenes. Jesse Glenn was kind enough to provide me some melody that I could work from, and the Glen of Glen Stone is an homage to Jesse's last name. And the Ivory Lass is also an allusion to Gwendolyn. You can download a free MP3 of this song, performed by Jesse Glenn, in the download section of MouseGuard.net. On a long journey to Glenstone, I sailed right into its shade. There before me, she proudly shone. My decision was already... Page 14, panel 1. To delay showing Saxon and the bat's fates, I wanted to take up a lot of room on the page again with an establishing shot of that double-domed bone chamber. In amongst the bones, you can see a tiny little Saxon and a tiny little bat. This was an angle that made it handy to have a physical model to spin around for reference, though I actually had to cut a hole in the base of it to angle the camera up in this direction. Panels 2 and 3. Saxon waking up and touching his head now shows that he's alive, and the next panel of the bat with dead eyes was supposed to make that character's death clear, but I've heard from some that it wasn't so obvious. Panel 4. As Saxon climbs down the bone pile past the bat, the lyrics proclaim, My body is weak and it may break. Though not today. 
as well as my fallen companions in rows to help enforce the bat's death. Page 15. This scene is described in the working outline as hell for mice. Like the cover, drawing the piles of bones on these pages was actually a soothing activity. I didn't pencil them in, but just made an outline for the overall mass, and then when I was inking, I'd put in all the forms and shadows to imply the different skeleton parts. At the bottom of the page, I tried to sync up the line to raise, raise me out of my tomb out to out Saxon leaving the bone chamber, as he may be thinking of the one mouse he's loved from afar. Page 16. I had to stagger which panels got the lyrics to help space the song out over the course of the entire scene, but also to get the right lyrics to fall on the right panel moments. This series of panels shows Saxon figuring out the pot beneath the torch bracket as lamp oil. It's a bit odd to me now. That's a strange place to store oil. But it makes for a nice visual four panels of Saxon problem-solving, wrapping a bone in cloak, dipping in oil, and striking a spark from his sword on the stone so that he can see where he's going for the rest of the scene. Page 17. I also built a model of the prison area, though it wasn't well built, and kept warping and losing its properties as being a perspective aid as I worked on framing the panels in this part of the story. In the end, I had to reinforce the model with hot melt glue and wooden framing. I'll talk more about this model on the next page, though. The lyrics are hitting a few Raising words that match up with panel little, one. Raising what little I owned and shown light as Saxon lifts his torch. Panels two through four are meant to just be the horrors of what the mice in Dark Heather endured. I stole the idea of the raised cages from a scene in Fafford and the Grey Mouser comic that Mike Mignola adapted with Howard Chaikin. I put tick marks on the wall to show that this was a long injustice and showed cloaks and chains to give the reader the impression it wasn't only defenseless mice citizens who were the victims of the Weasel War. Page 18, panel 1. And what's one more panel of a mouse skeleton horror, this time being woven into a spider's web, a visual that actually ties into a backstory of Saxon's induction into the guard that I want to tell someday. Panel 2. The lyrics here hit on all that was left was me as Saxon walks through this nightmare. The model was meant to echo the hexagon theme in all the decorative tile work of the weasels. So the center of this area is that shape, and the arches and triangular columns branch out from it, presumably to connect up to the same hexagonal arrangement again and again and again, a modular repeating design. But because of the imprecision of the model I made, I could never get a good image of the floor layout repeating. The geometry just wasn't accurate enough. So this pullback view of one section was as much as I went for showing all at once. Panel 3. The sword and cloak on this mouse are a little more established than what we see in the other panels with skeletons, so I hoped that Saxon's reaction in this panel would make sense to the reader that something's different here. Page 19. Here lie the bones of Saxon's mentor Lucas, with sword and cloak and clasp. I wanted to push the emotion of the winter book beyond anything I had done in fall, and one of the questions I asked myself was, what would it take to break Saxon? How do you make him cry? And Lucas's bones and gear were my way. I designed the sword, knowing Saxon would end up owning it, to be something much more visually striking than the boring hilts I kept drawing Saxon with. Across the hilt is the word niert, which is Gaelic for strength, although I probably didn't pronounce that correctly, as well as the acorn pommel that implies the strength of the oaks. The ends of the hilt are serpent designs. I'll talk more about the sword in later issues. But I do want to point out a flaw here of why would the weasels allow Lucas to be in prison with a sword? And ultimately, it's because I needed Saxon to end up owning that sword. It doesn't make a whole lot of logical sense, but narratively, it fit the bill. Lucas's clasp is based on a real cloak pin that I found in a photo archive of a historic collection. Page 20, panel 1. A flashback panel to put the bones in context for the reader. While the role-playing game wasn't released yet, and so the explanation of how a guard becomes a guard mouse hadn't been answered, here, Saxon is training in sword work with his master. 
The Mouse Lucas was an homage to George Lucas, who was my teacher in the hero's journey and monomyth that Joseph Campbell wrote about, but that George used as a guide for the original Star Wars movies. So my understanding of those teachings of Campbell's are not from the Epic of Gilgamesh or Greek heroes, but instead from a galaxy far, far away. I also named a fair few of my D&D characters, Lucas. Panels 2 and 3. To make the emotion really settle in for Saxon and for the reader, I opted to show him crying and embracing the bones of his master for two panels, not just one. A closer shot, and then something pulled back, showing how hellish this all is as the song wraps up its chorus. Page 21, panel 1. Another scene change, back to Lock Haven. Because I was worried the audience wouldn't follow that transition, I added in the narration box explaining where we are. The outline had this scene listed as, quote, Abigail found in the larder, colon, speech, end quote. I did use my model of the Lockhaven larder for these pages, but it seems like I only looked at it for reference and figuring out the camera angles, because all of the roughs have these backgrounds drawn from scratch. Because the story stated that Lockhaven supplies were low, I had to draw the larder looking a little understocked, where my normal tendency would have been to overfill those shelves, those wine racks, baskets, and barrels with grain and fruit, herbs and ales. Coming down the stairway are two of the guard mice from issue three tasked by Gwendolyn to found Abigail the Poisoner. Panel two. This reverse angle of the larder shows the ovens of Lockhaven, a design I based on the Baker Mouse drawing under Common Mouse Trades in the fall hardcover extras. When I started this scene, I had no idea what the other end of the larder looked like, but I thought ovens would be a really good visual cue that the larder is also attached to the kitchens. Panel 3. I'm not thrilled about the poses and perspective on the mice drawing back their bowstrings, but I do like the framing of the panel with Abigail down in front calling them fools. Page 22, panels 1 through 3. Remember the outline for this scene said speech? Well, here goes Abigail's monologue, justifying all of her actions. In the fall epilogue, I wrestled with the idea that Midnight's followers, who survived, would just abandon the thoughts they had that led them to support Midnight. Abigail now reveals that she, as well as followers in other towns, purposely forced the supply shortages to get guard mice out into the bitter winter cold. And with so many mice getting paired up romantically, why shouldn't Midnight be any different, even though he's gone? Abigail was to be his queen. Panel 4. The archers loose their arrows into Abigail, perhaps unwisely. Here again you can see the sparse supply shelves, and looking at this now, I wish I had done some color holds on those glass containers to make them seem a bit more transparent. Page 23, panel 1. Falling through a hole into blackness seems to be a theme in this issue, but with two arrows in her back, Abigail probably won't fare as well as Saxon. Panels two through four, and as she tumbles down the well, the mice realize her plan to poison them all. I did try an alternate layout to this page where the second panel shows the two archers looking at one another in a, oh no, what have we done expression, and the third panel being a version of what was published as what is now the fourth panel with the final panel on the page then being a wider shot as other guard mice come down the stairs to discover the awful truth. But this published version with the close-up of the poison drip on the stone I think still makes for better storytelling. Color story-wise, this issue has three main tones. A light purpley blue for the snow scenes, a darker purpley blue for the dark heather scenes, and then a yellow, which is the complement of purple, for the Lockhaven scenes. Pinup by Nate Pride. I knew Nate from the local comic convention, but while I was working on either the end of fall or the beginning of winter, he became part of our weekly art group meetup. And Nate's a great friend. For his pinup, he wanted to know what I was doing in the issue, what was going to happen. And I told him about the scene where Saxon finds Lucas. I don't remember if Nate came up with the ghost form of Lucas, or if I did, but it was probably Nate. I must have drawn some of the reference, like Lucas's sword and costume, before Nate started on this piece, but I don't think I had any of the bone chamber or prison architecture designed yet, since Nate came up with something totally of his own. 
I always loved the idea of Mouse Guard having ghosts as the sole supernatural occurrence, so I'm really grateful to Nate for adding an instance of it into the published material. Nate later went on to contribute a Legends of the Guard story titled The Ballad of Nettledown. And that's the fourth issue of Mouse Guard, Winter 1152. It has been collected in a hardcover published by Archaea. If you've enjoyed this commentary, please leave comments in the section below, let me know what I didn't answer for you in this issue, and subscribe for updates when I add more Mouse Guard commentary. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>